Playing Dune now, knowing that it was released in 1992, kind of boggles the mind. Because if you strip away the tech limitations of the time, this is the sort of game that I would expect to see out now, made by some indie developer that only has a few hundred followers on Twitter. For the longest time, I didn't even know this game existed. I was aware of Dune 2, I had played that, but it was already 10 years old when I played it, so I didn't really think about it having a prequel of any sort. It was after I had gotten broadband internet in the second half of the 2000s that I found out there was this other Dune out there, a Dune 1, let's call it. So in this video, I'll analyze this first Dune, your dad's Dune and ask the question, is it a classic? So why would I expect to see Dune now, produced by an indie? Because it's a fairly unique blend of genres. It mixes a point and click adventure with a real time quasi grand strategy game and manages to do so while at the same time creating an impressively immersive world. You are Paul Atreides, recently arrived on Arrakis, also known as Dune, the desert planet. Arrakis, Dune. The only place in the known universe that produces a special substance, a spice called melange, which increases human lifespan and allows for interstellar faster than light space travel. Dune is already occupied by our family's sworn enemies House Harkonnen and everyone is mining the spice for the Emperor who calls in every week or so to ask for steadily increasing amounts of spice. The planet is inhabited by a hardy people called the Fremen whom you will have to get on your side to train as part of your troops. Fremen can be trained to mine spice, to become soldiers, or you can tell them to become ecologists later in the game and start turning the desert green. The grand strategy layer of the game is focused in the first half of the game around you discovering the map's various Fremen settlements, called sieges, prospecting for spice and assigning your various troops of Fremen to either farm spice or to become soldiers. Later in the game, you can train them in ecology, a move that will have them plant greenery in their zones, thus destroying the spice production and making the area useless to the Harkonnen. There are several other resources, such as spice harvesters, ornithopters and a variety of weapons that you need to outfit your troops with in order to improve their output. You'll find some of these abandoned at various locations, but you can also buy them from smugglers by using spice. What has to be mentioned here is how easy to understand the various gameplay features is. It also helps that the game starts off fairly slow, allowing you time to experiment and see which commands do what. And trust me, there's quite a few things you can do or have your troops do. But I can't remember the last time I was onboarded onto a game so smoothly. As you do all of these things, you'll have to move around quite a bit, and during the first half of the game, you will do most of this by Ornithopter, a flying machine which looks like a dragonfly, from whose cockpit you can see the desolate terrain of Dune, which corresponds with what you see on the minimap. You can either set known destinations or simply fly towards custom set points, and if you have other characters with you, they will see locations where you can land. As you progress in the game, Paul gains a psychic ability which will allow you to communicate with your troops at increasingly larger distances, but you'll still need to physically move around because you won't be able to cover the entire planet with your now expanded consciousness. Likewise, there are particular moments in the game when certain events will take place that you will more or less trigger through your decisions of talking to people and taking them with you. You interacting with the other characters in the game is the point and click adventure component. The characters will give you information about what is going on as well as tell you what needs to be done. You can take up to two characters with you and depending on who they are and their interests they might not want to leave certain areas or might wish to be taken to particular places in order to advance the plot of the game. All of this happening in real time on a clock that never stops. There is a day-night cycle which you can observe through the wonderful color changes. Granted, nobody in the game seems to have the need to sleep and the ornithopter doesn't need any sort of fuel either, so you can fly around for as long as you want, but you won't be able to do that forever because you'll need to send weekly shipments of spice to the emperor. And if you miss a shipment, well, this happens. Eventually, it comes down to fighting with the Harkonnen, while still maintaining your spice production. 
Keeping in mind though that with the exception of the gear you buy from the smugglers you only need the spice to pay off the emperor. So you can get away with having a bunch of spice mining troops from the beginning of the game and use those till the end because the more a troop spends time doing one thing, whether it's mining or combat training, the better they get at it. The game does have a type of time limit on it. Not in terms of days, but in terms of spice. Each region has a limited amount of spice that can be mined and the Emperor's requests keep on coming and keep on getting larger. So at a certain point, he'll ask for more spice than you have in your reserves and that's when you lose. So you must do your best to optimize both spice harvesting as well as outfitting your troops with weapons and gear from smugglers. However, there's also a more peaceful way of ending the game. Once you meet Liet Kynes, your Fremen troops can specialize in ecology and start planting vegetation in their regions, instead of either mining or training. What this will do is effectively destroy all the spice in that region pretty much instantly. Which is a bummer, but it will also cause the vegetation to continue growing northwards. And northwards is where all the Harkonnen territory is. So you could end the game through vegetation, not military battles. Although you'll still need troops to take over the enemy cities and to stop the Harkonnen attacks when they start. The game only features a few sound effects here and there. Your main auditory experience will be given by the soundtrack and the game's music is something truly special. Initially I could not enjoy any of the sound at all because I was playing the My Abandonware version of the game but I accidentally stumbled into making the, that same version play sound. Instead of running the executable Dune PRG, run Dune.bat and the game will now also play music. Each separate screen of the game will feature a different song and they're all really interesting and appropriate. The soundtrack actually got a separate CD release as well, which wasn't really done back then. Nowadays we're used to many games, even indies, releasing their soundtracks separately but back in 1992, this was fairly new territory. The pixel art style is possibly one of the more surprising things in the game, especially when it comes to the fidelity of recreating the movie versions of Paul and Jessica. The pixel art versions are strikingly similar to the screen versions. But on a lighter note, check out Paul's eyebrows here going something like, hey kids, want some spice? But this also makes one wonder why only these two got the pixel art treatment while everyone else does not. Duncan Idaho, for instance, looks like Kim Jong-un. I mean, look at it. I mean, it's uncanny, right? Is it just me? Faye Drautha is somewhat sting adjacent, that's true, but otherwise all the other characters have nothing in common with their 1984 movie counterparts. But I gotta say, Stilgar looks a little bit like Jason Momoa's Duncan Idaho from the 2021 movie, if you squint your eyes a bit. You also get to see the developers' interpretations of what spice harvesters and steel suits look like. I appreciate the steel suits especially. First of all, because they're brightly colored. Which isn't something you'd really want as a desert people who travels mainly by night and wish to keep their number secret from the Empire, but... But they look good within the setting of the game and also they look very organic. To me, they look akin to Giger's Xenomorph designs, but that could just be me. So up until now, I've talked about the game overall, its mechanics, visuals, music, cool. But you have the game on the one hand, and on the other, you have the game's interpretation of Dune's world. And I say world because the game takes inspiration from the 1984 movie and from the book as well, to create a plot that has nothing to do with either. Which I really have to tip my hat to the designer for having the courage to do so. Nowadays, the purists would have come out of the woodwork and slammed the game for its lack of authenticity because it wasn't identical to the book in everything it did. In the game, both houses are on Arrakis and the Atreides take up residence in the city of Carthag, while the Harkonnen are headquartered in Arrakeen. The inciting event of the actual story is the Emperor ordering the House Atreides to take over Arrakis from House Harkonnen in something of a peaceful transition. And the Atreides take residence in the city of Arrakeen because the city of Carthag was the Harkonnen's capital during their rule. 
That being said, there are lots of references and little touches around the game which show the developer's knowledge of the book. For instance, the bullhead mounted in Leto's room, using the name Hara, as well as many of the siege names, not to mention this gem. The sleeper must awaken. So now come up the question, what maketh a video game a classic? Some would say it's objective, some would say it depends, and there's definitely something to be said about subjective classics, which is something I talk about in this series as well. But in order for the game to be an objective classic, it has to be considered to be good over a period of time, has to be remembered as such, and also it has to stand up to current day scrutiny. And I also consider that 10 years is the minimum period required for such a hindsight-based judgment to take place. In this case, it's been almost 30. I think this is the oldest game I've covered in the series until now, so we're very cool. From the gameplay perspective, Dune has very sound concepts, tried and tested ones over the past 30 years actually, and features a still unrivaled blend of genres. There are some obvious places where things could be streamlined nowadays, however. If you could bump up the resolution, the game would be fairly acceptable for today's standards. It's still playable, don't get me wrong, just a little bit too time consuming if you ask me. A bit, uh, kind of way too many clicks, for my liking at least. Dune did very well for the time, both commercially and critically, being released on the Amiga at the same time as the MS-DOS version and its CD version, which was a super novelty at the time got ported to the Sega slash Mega CD as well. Yet, I had never heard of it till, like I said, the second half of the 2000s when I finally had broadband internet and I could find out about it. Even though I was keenly aware that the other Dune I played, the first Dune I played, had a 2 after it. Unfortunately, it got buried in the sands of Arrakis by its considerably more well-known sort of sequel from Westwood the game which would virtually birth a major gaming genre. And rest assured, I'll get around to Dune 2 when the maker allows for it. I think Dune might have had a better chance at remaining in the public consciousness if it weren't for the failure of 2002's Frank Herbert's Dune, which bankrupted the development studio. So, is your dad's Dune game a classic? Well, according to my requirements, it isn't. Oh, oh but I think it should be. And you know, it might actually become one now with lots of people either discovering it or rediscovering it and making videos about it. And as it usually is with all of my Is It A Classic titles, I am super curious to find out about your experiences and knowledge of them. So first of all, were you aware that this game existed? Then, if you did play it, on which platform did you play it first and when? Do you still have a box copy of it? I'm super curious to find out all of these things. So please leave a comment because that's the only way in which we will be able to appease the maker, I mean the AI. And you can also find the rest of my Dune related videos in a playlist that you'll see on screen right now, as well as a playlist of my Is It A Classic videos. I also have a Patreon page, so if you have spice to spend, please go and check that out. Also keep in mind that I tend to stream rather regularly on Twitch. I've been Steven Hansens, thank you very much for watching, have a great rest of your day, and hopefully you'll see me next time.